This is Matthew of Another World Terraria, where I teach and inspire you on the topics of rare plants and artistic nature displays. Welcome to part three of the Crown Forest Build Log. In part two, I went over construction of the foundation and primary hardscape, which was phase three of my six phase build process. In this video, I'm going to take you through phase four, which includes adding substrate, roots, and complementary details. After the foundation and hardscape were mostly done, the terrarium was ready for substrate. I mixed together some horticultural charcoal and sea chem fluorite to use as a base layer. I chose those because they're well draining and never biodegrade. The sea chem has iron and other minerals, and the charcoal can, to a limited extent, remove certain chemicals or impurities that may gather or develop over time in the substrate. To reach some of the tighter areas in the tank, I used my homemade spaghetti box funnel. After the base substrate was in place, it was time to move on to the clay layer. I'm not going to go into much detail about the clay mix, because in the future I will be creating a separate video all about that subject, but essentially this is red pottery clay mixed with peat moss. I mixed in enough peat that the clay became a darker brownish red, and the fibers of the peat were visible when I broke the mix apart. By the way, there are some Amazon links in the description for some of the products used in this video in case you want to get any of those things for your own project. I gradually built up a layer of clay by pressing small amounts at a time over the foam. At first I was mostly going for coverage, then later I would go in and tweak the shape and the surface. Since the clay mix was soft and moldable, it was easy to blend each successive chunk together, as well as to adjust the thickness and shape as desired. At a point, I had to remove a bit of foam that was sticking too far out, so I sliced it up with an X-Acto blade and then picked the pieces out with tweezers. I wanted to try working the clay around and between the roots that I'd already placed so I wouldn't have to figure out the placement again later, but I realized that wasn't going to work, so I removed the roots. This ended up being a good thing because I came up with a better rootscape later, and also it was convenient to be able to press the roots into the clay after it had been laid down. Here's a shot of the tank after I'd applied clay over the existing foundation. Before I could finish the scape, I had to add some substrate and then build up the slope on the left side with spray foam, which you'll watch me do in just a minute. The reason I added more foam at this stage instead of earlier when I sprayed the other foam is because until this point, I wasn't 100% sure exactly how I wanted to shape the left side of the layout. First, I needed to fill the left side of the outer gutter with sand. I mixed up a couple different types of sand to get a color that I liked and then funneled it into the gutter space. Next, I needed to build up the slope, so it was time to spray more expanding foam. Because of the amount of space and the height which I needed to fill out, I decided to add the foam in two separate applications. This is the first session for the bottom portion of the slope. Here's the foam shortly after spraying. Since I needed to wait till the next day for the foam to cure, I decided to start adding in the rootscape. As always, when working with hardscape elements, especially roots like these, I take my time. I'd rather be very patient in the beginning and get it perfect than rush through it and be dissatisfied later. I don't have a lot of video footage of laying out the roots because it's a lengthy process of trial and error with dozens of roots in various positions and combinations. Note that I have a white foam core board behind the tank which helps me clearly see the elements and avoid visual distractions that could interfere with or impact the composition. Here's the partially completed rootscape for the right side of the layout. I did a little more work on the roots beyond what you see here, which you'll see in the next photo. Also, now that the foam on the left was cured, I needed to do another spraying session. I put some painter's tape on the glass to help visualize the slope, then sprayed more foam. This wide shot shows the tape outline and how it completes the slope up into the corner of the tank. I kept the foam application below the tape level to allow for expansion as well as for the thickness of clay substrate and plants that would come later. Note that there are more roots added here than in the previous rootscape photo. The additional roots are thinner ones that add variety and a natural look. Next, I filled the outer gutter with sand. And then I continued applying the clay substrate by laying down small flattened sheets over the sand gutter up to the glass wall. There are a couple of roots visible here that I added to the left side of the stump base. Note that I plunged the roots into the substrate and then covered part of them with clay and smoothed it over so they're only partially exposed. The right side of the tank now has a thin layer of clay substrate over everything, so none of the drainage layer or sand is visible. I kept the clay layer relatively thin here because I wanted to keep the scape on the right side shallow, and I also wanted to make it easier for excess water to go through into the drainage and sand layers. 
Note how the thin layer of clay with a bed of dark sand underneath is very clean looking and aesthetically pleasing as opposed to showing a layer of gravel or other drainage material. I finished the substrate application on the left side of the stump by layering on more clay over the foam slope. I kept the clay slope away from the front glass and made a steep vertical rise and then tapered it back into the upper corner. Here's the finished clay slope. Next I wanted to add some roots to the left side of the scape. Here's a before photo and here's after. This image clearly shows how the roots are embedded into the clay. It's easy to press the roots in place as well as to make minor adjustments, then you can just smooth the clay over to fill in any gaps. The clay holds the roots in place securely and there's no need to use any kind of adhesive. Note that the roots curl around and then point downwards as opposed to pointing directly away from the stump and up the slope. I'll talk more about that later. Here's a continuation of the roots from the upper slope down to the bottom of the tank. I want to point out that I used a variety of root thicknesses and shapes to avoid an artificial appearance, which you'll also see when I show the full tank shot in a bit. Also note, as mentioned earlier, that some of the roots have only a small portion visible, that is, they disappear into the substrate in some places. Breaking up the shapes like this makes it look far more natural than if all the roots just drape down on the surface. Let's take a closer look at the rootscape and go over some design theory. This part is going to be very comprehensive and detailed, so feel free to skip ahead if it gets too long for you. Let's get started. Although the roots go in various directions, there is still an overall pattern to the composition. The roots essentially start at the stump base and then flow outward from there, just as you'd expect a real root mass to grow. Earlier, I pointed out that the roots on the upper left slope curved around and then point down, as opposed to spreading up the slope and away from the stump base. I did this because it looked more realistic to me, it added some variety to the composition, and it also helped the visual flow to move from left to right. If the roots stuck out to the left and up the slope, it would oppose the overall flow of elements moving from left to right. You can even see that the longest, thinnest root on the left sweeps down and around to the right in an arc, following the natural lines of the composition. In general, the roots get thinner as they get farther away from the stump base. There are still a variety of root thicknesses at the base and the midway point, but the ones farthest right are all thin and taper off. Besides looking more natural, this ensures a smooth visual flow and allows the three smaller wood pieces to grab more attention toward the end of the composition. I selected a few thick anchor roots and positioned them in a way that they create a strong base for the composition and grab the viewer's attention, and then added thinner roots on from there, then finally the thinnest roots for detail. I was careful that the thickest roots were still significantly thinner than the scape wood, so the stump remained the center of attention and there was a natural relative scale. I wove the roots between the wood scape and have a few crossing over each other, however I avoided any extreme crossover angles that would create a visual sticking point for the viewer. Pay attention to how the roots come in and out of the clay in different spots so you never see an entire root from the stump base to the end. This looks more natural makes it seem like the substrate eroded over time, and gives the illusion that there are more roots than there actually are. Another great thing about intermittent root visibility is that you can combine partial sections of roots instead of needing to find entire lengths of perfect roots to use. The majority of roots in this composition are just short sections with broken ends, but the human brain connects the dots so the complete picture is created in the viewer's imagination. I also varied the height and distance from the substrate, with some of the roots hugging or being partially embedded in the clay, and others arching up and over with a gap below. This variation looks more natural and helps emulate an eroded look. At this point, I decided to remove the white foam core board, turn off the lights, and then add the LED light unit to see how the tank would look on display. Now the scape was really coming to life. The low ambient light with directional top lighting from the LED creates a more dramatic and moody feeling and also adds depth and contrast. I'll talk about the LED light later in this series of videos. I was extremely happy with the entire build at this point and felt that the roots and substrate were good to go. It was time to take everything to the next level by adding some complementary details. If you want your builds to look extremely natural and artistic, I'd advise that you pay attention to the details and ensure that there are a variety of textures and or harmonious colors. I took some paver sand and sifted out the fine particles, leaving these tiny pebbles behind. Then I randomly sprinkled them all over the tank. Next, I grabbed some crushed dragonstone and randomly sprinkled it all over the tank, making sure to include some very fine particles as well as a few slightly larger chunks. 
One more detail I wanted to add was some leaf litter. I went through a bag of willow oak leaves and picked out the smallest ones I could find. Then I sparingly placed a few leaves throughout the tank, being careful not to overwhelm the hardscape or overall composition. These close-up shots illustrate how effective it can be to add small details and texture and color variations to a design. Here's a display shot of the finished scape. I'm now going to reveal yet another of my special techniques. At this point, most people would go straight into planting the tank, and in the past, I probably would have also. However, over time and with experience, I've developed a preference for letting woodscapes go through a mold cycle before adding plants and moss. The mold cycling steps are 1. Set up the wood hardscape 2. Add springtails and isopods 3. Moisten the wood and tank, then put on the cover so it becomes humid. 4. Let the wood mold over for a few days to a week. 5. Add more microfauna if needed. 6. If desired, you can speed up the process by occasionally manually removing some of the mold with a paper towel or brush. And 7. When the mold dissipates significantly, you can begin planting. The time frame will depend on a variety of factors such as what type of wood you used, how wet the tank is, and so on. On average, I wait at least three weeks before planting. I call this the mold cycle method. The benefits of this method are, one, the mold cannot spread onto moss or plants and cause harm to them. And two, by not having plants and moss, the microfauna are forced to focus on the wood and mold instead of being tempted by plant foliage and substrate. After the Crown Forest went through the AWT mold cycle, it was ready to be planted. I'll cover that and much more in the next video in the series. If you'd like me to make more videos like this one, the best thing you can do is hit the like button and then share the video with other people who'd also enjoy and benefit from it. Thanks a lot and I'll see you soon in part 4 of the Crown Forest build log.